Hi, Dr. Matthew Weiner from Commerce Michigan here to talk to you about what I believe really causes weight gain and weight loss. We've all been told that, that weight gain is caused by eating more calories than you burn and weight loss by burning more than you eat and it's a simple matter of just adjusting the formula in your favor so that this temporary inconvenience of obesity will disappear. But I'm going to talk to you today about a better way of looking at weight gain and weight loss. I do not believe that it is really this simple. When we work with patients who are gaining say five pounds a year and at over 20 years have gained 100 pounds, if you look at the math on this simple um, equation about the calories consumed versus the calories burned, we're talking about 50 calories a day in difference that result in over 20 years 100 pounds of weight gain. It's not that simple. This is a much more complicated problem. We're using arithmetic when we really need to be using something along the lines of calculus or even more complicated mathematical techniques. It's a very, very uh, complicated process uh, that has a, a rich network of hormones and nerve systems uh, that, that will interact to help uh, modify your fat stores. I call this system your metabolic thermostat. And the idea is, is that our body has this inborn set point this weight that, that it wants to maintain. And then if we reduce our calorie intake by going on a restrictive calorie diet, 1,200, 1,400 calories a day, what we see is that as your weight moves away from your set point, our body doesn't just sit there and take it, it compensates. It's going to increase your hunger, eventually to the point of food obsession, and it's gonna decrease your metabolism so that it starts to match this eight or 12, 800, 1,000, or 1,200 calorie a day diet that you're consuming. And as a result, you'll lose weight at first, and then it will stop. And so attempts to starve the weight off by cutting down on the calories, by skipping meals, you're going to, to, to end up fighting against your physiology. And in a battle of you versus your physiology, you will lose every single time. The analogy I use is holding your breath. Most of us can hold our breath for 10 seconds, many for 30 seconds, some for 60 seconds, none for 10 minutes. And because of that, we have to recognize that the same thing, if we're in a food abundant environment, which is what we, what we live in, that we may be able to maintain a calorie restricted diet for a month, two months, six months. I've met patients a year or two who've been able to, to stay on an 800 calorie a day diet. But ultimately, over the long run, something's going to happen in your life. There's going to be a stressor. You'll fail and you'll regain the weight immediately. And so we can't just restrict the calorie intake. We have to make other adjustments. So if we're going to look at the causes of weight gain, we have to ask ourselves not what causes us to eat too much, but we have to say what causes our set point to go up. And in fact, there are many, many causes, and this is a, a pretty extensive list, but it is by no means comprehensive. There are a lot of other things that are not on this list that will cause your set point to raise. So let's kind of check these off one by one. So the first, stress and depression. Stress is essentially a, um, a prolonged use of our fight or flight uh, response system. Our body was designed for acute episodes of stress. We're minding our own business, walking out of the cave, and boom, we stare right into a mountain lion's eyes, and it's five feet away from us. Our body has a really fantastic system for managing this type of stress. You're going to see this, this surge of all kinds of adrenaline, and every other nerve in your body is going to be heightened, and you are going to be thinking clearly. Time is going to be moving slower. You're going to be stronger and faster than you ever have been before in your life, so you can manage this acute stress. But the problem is there's no mountain lions in our lives and this acute physical danger is not something we see in, on a daily basis or even a weekly or monthly basis for most of us. What we deal with is mortgage troubles and financial stresses and spouse, spousal troubles, troubles with your children, troubles at work. It's chronic issues that play out over time and our body's using this fight or flight mechanism because it's all we have. And what we see is we see prolonged increases of hormones like cortisol, and these hormones will, over time, result in an elevation of your set point. And, and essentially, we're using a system to handle a problem that it was not designed for, and oftentimes the result is, is obesity. Medications are a 
huge issue, very, very common in my practice. I see patients who are taking steroids, corticosteroids. I see uh, the use of Depo-Provera, which is a, a depot um, uh, birth control method. Uh, a lot of sleep agents, mood stabilizers, um, and several other drugs cause significant weight gain. And one thing I work with when patients come into my office, the first thing we look at, we go right through their medication list and make sure that none of these medications are causing weight gain. And if they are, we're working with their primary physician or the pr prescribing physician to try to minimize or optimize their regimen so that they're not gaining weight as a result. Inactivity or injury, again, very common. I see patients who have been able to maintain their weight certainly were overweight, but haven't really crossed over into that danger zone where it starts to impact their health and their quality of life until they're in a car accident, they throw out their back, they um, uh, uh, tear the meniscus in their knee, uh, injure their foot in some way. It's an orthopedic issue that results in a prolonged period of inactivity. That prolonged period of inactivity results in muscle loss, muscle wasting, and a decrease in what's called NEAT, non-exercise activity time. The amount that we're moving around throughout the day, the stair climbing, the little quick jog around the corner, all these movements that we perform on a daily basis will be diminished significantly. And as a result, we're going to see that set point climb to a higher level. Processed foods also are a major, major contributor. Yes, they're very calorie dense and they contain primarily processed carbohydrates which are rapidly absorbed and cause high spikes of insulin and other um, uh, unfavorable hormonal shifts that result in obesity and weight gain, but they also are very addictive. And I think all of us know someone who's addicted to a certain um, uh, type of chip or candy or some processed food that they really just can't stop eating. And it's these addictions that start to overwhelm and, and our, our thermostat and they take up, um, they take over our hunger drive and we eat even if we're, we're, we've met our, our uh, calorie expenditure for the day. So they break that metabolic thermostat. Sugar sweetened beverages, these are public enemy number one. In my opinion, this is, these are the most fattening foods on the planet. Our body has a system designed to manage thirst and a system designed to manage hunger. And if you're thirsty and you eat, you're still thirsty. And if you're hungry and you drink, you're still hungry. If we take uh, uh, patients and we give them, say, a, a piece of chocolate cake that has 200 calories and then expose them to a buffet of unlimited food and see how much food they consume, what we find is that that patient who's eaten the piece of cake will on average eat 200 fewer calories than someone who hasn't eaten the cake. So even though cake is a processed food, contains a lot of sugar, and is certainly something that we wouldn't want to eat, we all recognize that if I'm hungry and I eat a piece of cake, I will be less hungry afterward. And we do that same experiment, but repl replace the cake with a sugar-sweetened beverage, and you drink a 200 calorie sugar sweetened beverage and then go to the buffet table, you will eat the exact same number of calories as someone who has not had the sugar sweetened beverage. And that's because the sugar sweetened beverage is going to address our thirst issues, but it does nothing to address our hunger issues. And so that those 200 calories in that sugar sweetened beverage, they sit outside of your thermostat. They're not going to regulate your hunger. They're not going to regulate your metabolism in the way that other foods will. So in my opinion, if you have, want to lose weight, if this is even a, a minor goal of yours, you have to eliminate these drinks. This is not just the full sugar soda pop. This is fruit juice. Apple juice and orange juice are nearly as damaging as the pop. Energy drinks like... Uh, um, Monster and Red Bull, sports drinks like Gatorade and Powerade, uh, sugar in your coffee or the, uh, the mochaccino, frappuccino stuff that you'll get at the coffee shops. These are things that have to be completely eliminated from your diet if you want any hope of, of losing weight and maintaining it over the long run. Hormones in beef, also I think an, an under-recognized problem. When we take a, a cow that we want to bring to market, if we allow that cow to roam free and eat grass, on average it'll take about two years before that cow reaches a size at which point it can be butchered for the meat. 
you can drop that down to six to nine months by feeding the cow large amounts of corn and providing hormones to stimulate the appetite. And when, when we do this, um, these hormones trigger the cow to gain weight quickly. Most of these hormones are fat soluble, they're dissolved in the fat of the animal. And so when we eat the steak, when we eat the, the hamburger, we're going to have some of that hormone in, uh, in, ingested that may have that same weight gaining impact on us. So that's why I really push for patients to, to, to choose the grass fed varieties as opposed to the commercial store bought beef. Genetics is a huge factor. For some people, that overfed side of the spectrum is, uh, of, the, of, the, of your thermostat is very highly functional, where if they gain five or 10 pounds over the holidays, they just have to think a little bit differently, and next thing you know, they'll be at the gym four or five times, they'll eat um, a lot uh, less calories, they'll skip a few meals, and boom, they're right back at their set point weight. It's very intact and functions very well. Other patients, it does not work well at all. Just as some patients are uh, predisposed to diabetes, which is a high glucose, it's when we lose control of your glucose and it goes up, other patients are, are predisposed to obesity, which is where we lose control of our fat stores and our fat stores go up. Chronic disease, also a, a major contributor. Oftentimes that's linked to the medication use that, that drives this as well. Yo-yo dieting, I've had, I have a video on, on uh, uh, addresses this fact alone. This is a huge contributor to, to weight gain and, and an increase in your set point. This, this, these repeated episodes of starving yourself and then refeeding and starving and then refeeding will in the long run trigger an elevation of your set point. You don't regain the weight, you regain the weight and five pounds. A lack of sleep, also a major problem. Patients who work the night shift, i found, are one of the most difficult groups of people to get to lose weight. And then finally, pregnancy and menopause uh, also can contribute to an elevation in your set point. So if we're going to succeed at losing weight, we can't fight against our physiology. We can't starve ourselves. Instead, we have to learn how to shift that set point to a lower level. And what we see is if we're able to shift your set point, if you're starting at 250 pounds and we drop you to 150 pounds, if your set point can go to this new level, we find you on the overfed side of the spectrum, which is going to decrease your hunger and increase your metabolism and allow the weight to come off very naturally. So our goal is to lower our set point, not to fight against it. There are four ways to lower your set point. The first, is increased consumption of high nutrient food. Now this is a very different concept than eating less food or not eating grains or bread or not eating sugar. If you stop eating the processed foods that are causing the set point to go up, what will happen is your set point will stop going up. But unfortunately, it doesn't cause it to go down. And this is a critical, critical point to make. Many people think that, well, I've been drinking the two liter of pop a day, as soon as I stop, well, the weight's just going to fall right off. And I can tell you, having been through this with you know, hundreds of patients at this point, that's not the case. When you stop drinking pop, in general, what happens is you stop gaining weight at a rapid rate. You don't start losing weight. If you're going to lose weight, you have to do the opposite. You have to eat large amounts of the high nutrient food, the fruit, vegetables, nuts, seeds, and beans. These are the foods you got to eat in large amounts and over time that will cause your set point to go down. We want to build muscle and use it. This is different than exercising. There is a role for medications but at this point it's fairly limited and finally when all else fails bariatric surgery. So again getting back to this idea of eating large amounts of high nutrient food. It's not about starving yourself. It's not about fighting against your physiology. It's about eating tremendous amounts. And it, what it is, is it's this accumulation over time of all of these phytonutrients that exist in food, in the healthy foods, in the unprocessed foods, in the fruits, vegetables, nuts, seeds, and beans, that are going to slowly drive your set point down, ounce by ounce by ounce, over the months and years, we'll see that, that set point come down, we'll see this, the number on the scale come down. Sometimes it's slow, sometimes it's fast, it depends on a lot of different factors but it will work in the long run if we apply the discipline and the changes over time. 
I have a smartphone app that is called Caloratio. It's available for free. And instead of this counting the total number of calories, this measures the quality of your diet. So it determines, hey, am I eating large amounts of fruits, vegetables, nut, nuts, seeds, and beans? And we have a diagram here at the bottom that shows the foods that will raise your set point versus the foods that will lower your set point. And if you can eat a diet that is that has a high calorie ratio score. And the only way to get your calorie ratio score high is to eat large amounts of these healthy calories and eliminate or limit significantly the processed calories. Then we can, by, getting, by maintaining a high calorie ratio diet, we can see that set point drift down over time. Next is building muscle and using it. This is not for everyone. And I think that's an important point. However, if you are relatively free of orthopedic issues, and if you can exercise at a vigorous uh, rate, then this is something to strongly consider. The impact of your workout, workout is going to be determined by the intensity more so than the duration. So this is about working out at a very high fitness level for short periods of time. It's three to five minute sprints often with short periods of rest. In general, if you're doing this type of exercise for more than 30 minutes, you're probably not doing it at an intense enough level because 30 minutes of this high intensity exercise should be all that almost anybody can handle. And this is what I work with my patients on achieving. And we can achieve it to some degree with everybody, but it has to be done very carefully um, in, a, in a controlled setting with, with trainers who know exactly what they're doing. I'm a big fan of body weight exercises like push-ups and pull-ups and sit-ups and squats and lunges as opposed to the machines or um, treadmills or or, um, or uh, uh, even barbell weights uh, because I think you're much more resistant to injury with these types of activities. I think you can get in a great workout and they're cheap. You don't need to join a gym. You can do them in your own home. What I like to talk to patients about is cardio through weights. It's not cardio. It's not weights. It's both at, at the same time. If you do 10 push-ups, then 10 sit-ups, then 10 squats, and you repeat that five times in a row as fast as you can, you can imagine how exhausted you're going to be when, it, when you finally finish that. You're going to be breathing very hard. Your heart's going to be racing at a, at a high level. You're going to get that cardiovascular workout, but at the same time, your chest and your shoulders and your arms and your legs are going to be killing you. You're also building muscle. You're using it at a maximal intensity. This is how you drive weight loss through exercise, not getting on the treadmill, setting it to, to the calorie setting and burning 200 calories at, at 3.2 miles per hour. So medications are um, getting a lot more attention lately, uh, but in fact, what we're finding is that there's really no new medications out there. There's, in my opinion, there's been almost nothing new out there in the last 10 or 15 years. What's happening is we're taking old medications, we're putting them together in combination pills, repatenting them and selling them for a high amount of money. It's a great business model, but for patients paying 200 bucks for medications that are actually available on generic, it's not serving your, your best interest. The most common and widely prescribed weight loss medication is Adipex, is also known as Phentermine. It's a stimulant drug. It's probably the most effective weight loss drug, but in general, it's poorly tolerated over time. And as we know, if this is going to lower your set point and then you stop taking it, what's going to happen when you stop taking it? Your set point's going to go up. You're going to regain the weight. And that's in general what we see in patients who use Adipex. Uh, and we also see resistance over time. So the first time you use it, you may lose 30 pounds, have a pretty good result. The next time it's 20. The time after that it's 10. So over time, it does lose its effect. And it is not all that well tolerated by a lot of patients. There's personality changes. Um, people can become very difficult to live with, and I've had patients tell me their spouse made them stop. Um, it also uh, can cause sleep disturbances and a lot of other issues with blood pressure uh, that do not make it a medication for everyone. I've used it in my practice a little bit, but it's not one that I, I use um, frequently. The next is Topamax, which is a seizure medication. Again, around for 30 or 40 years. We see some mild weight loss, and what's happened is that we now take Topamax, combine it with Adipex, we adjust the doses a little bit, and we call it Qsimia, which is one of the, uh, it's a, a fairly widely prescribed weight loss medication that's on the market. But it's nothing more than a combination of the Adipex and the Topamax, both of which have been around for 40 or 50 years. So you can buy these medications in the generic form um, at uh, probably a quarter of the price if, if you're on Qsimia. There's also Contrave, 
which is just Welbutrin, which is a widely prescribed antidepressant, and naltrexone, which is an opiate blocker. It blocks the, the receptors for morphine as well as the endorphins that you release during exercise. And the belief is, is that it blocks your pleasure centers that are released when you eat processed foods. And again, what we're seeing with Contrave, what we're seeing with Qsimia, what we're seeing with Belvic, which is the next medicine I'll talk about, is that in a small set of patients, we're seeing a reasonable amount of weight loss, about 10% of, um, uh, of their total body weight is lost. In a, in a significant percent, we see next to nothing. And so determining if you're one of these people who does lose weight from it, then it may be an option, but the majority of patients really will not have significant weight loss as a result. Belvic is a uh, medication that's very uh, similar to fenfluramine, which was half of fenfen, which has been pulled off the market because of the cardiac problems. Now, the, the, this medication reportedly does not have the same cardiovascular effects, but it was only tested on a relatively small sample of people, just as fenfluramine was decades ago. And as it's being used by millions of people, we may start seeing some of these same um, uh, cardiac valve problems that we saw with the fenfluramine. So Belvic, even though it's a new medication, it's a new drug, it's really in a very similar class to fenfluramine, which has been used for for again, decades, and it's now off the uh, market. And finally, there's an, um, uh, GLP analogs uh, like Victoza and Bieta, which are primarily used for diabetes, but we will see some weight loss with those. Um, it's relatively mild, but that is a, a new and evolving form of treatment. So it really, in summary, what we're seeing is a lot of old medications being used in new ways, being marketed and sold in, in a creative fashion to, to drive profits, but no real innovation in this space. And in fact, a very marginal response with the exception of a small group of patients who may lose a significant amount of weight with it. And these are things that I use very, very limited, in a limited fashion in my practice and, and uh, overall have been pretty unimpressed with the results. And then finally, and I think this is a very important point, bariatric surgery is a very realistic and successful option for long-term weight loss. And the way I approach bariatric surgery is I take patients and I work with them and I optimize their calorie ratio score and get them eating the best diet we possibly can. We get them exercising in the best way that we, we can. Again, most of the time we don't use medications, um, but we see what, our, what, what can we achieve through nutritional modification, through exercise modification. And in some patients, despite eating a really good diet and despite exercising on a regular basis, they may still not lose a significant amount of weight. And this is something we've all failed to grasp. We believe that this is simply a matter of willpower, and if you just put your mind to it, it can be done. But in fact, that's not true. There's physiology at play. There's a statistical um, likelihood of weight loss at play. Uh, there's something else going on besides just willpower. And in a, a very significant group of people, no matter what you do, you can't lose the weight. And if that is you, then, then that's the time to start thinking about adding an additional therapy, weight loss surgery. And what we find is that when we take patients who have a great diet, who are exercising regularly, we add the surgery in with an understanding of how all these lifestyle modifications are gonna play over the long run, we get a really powerful weight loss result. And for m most patients, that's the best we have in terms of medicine today. So in summary, stop counting calories, stop starving yourself, and start eating as much high nutrient food as you possibly can, Start exercising and give it everything you have over a short period of time. And if all else fails, if you've tried everything and it's not working, consider bariatric surgery. If you'd like to learn more about us, you can check out my practice's website at www.drmatthewiner.com or our Facebook page at A Pound of Cure or uh, any of the other videos we have on our YouTube channel. Thank you very much.